Hey, Mr. Paul, Here we go. Tell me what to do to make all my luck and lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Loves, the Pond Boss, checking in on Wednesday. I'm having a broadcast vertically because there's something goofy with my phone horizontally. If it ain't one thing, it's another, is what my mom always said. So, uh, holy cow, we just had a little hailstorm blow through here in North Texas. Hope you guys are all good. It, uh, I looked at the radar a while ago and there were like five storms, nice little burgeoning, gonna turn into supercell storms. The Thankfully, it's late in the afternoon, so it may not happen. I see Jason Nipstad, Willie Howell, Rick, Rob Wheaton, Mike Cottrell, Christopher Aguilar. Guys, I'm having a broadcast horizontal vertically because something's going on with my dad gum phone vertically and I don't know what it's weird John the garden's doing pretty good man I got some pretty good pretty cool stuff I'll take uh I'll take some pictures and send them um I was wanting to ask you a couple of questions I'll send those to you but I had some carrots I didn't harvest last year because they were small because they got a late start I left them over winter they didn't die they didn't freeze out now they're really taking off and I just kind of wondered about those I pulled one today Think I might eat it, and I'm kind of like, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to be. There's Christopher Aguilar over down in Louisiana, Frank James, vertical man. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I tried to turn it sideways, and it spread me out way bigger than I am, and we couldn't see everything, so I don't know what the deal is there. There's Josie. Josie and Wayne's checking in. Wayne's kind of in the crosshairs of this dead gum virus, so uh, you guys keep him in, 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 in our thoughts. He travels the nation, and he's up in New Jersey today, so... Uh, I know that he's safe because that's the way he rolls. Chris Rigoni, Justin Schenck, checking in from the left coast. Kevin Briggs from the Carolinas. Matt Singley, Danny Max, at a tone. Frank James, could you comment on the pluses and negatives of the amount of rain we're having this year? What steps should, you know what, let me uh, refresh my laptop so I can see these questions a little better. Have a look at them on my little broadcast device, iPhone. They're kind of hard to see, so... Bear with me one minute here while I find it. Let's see here. I need to do a little pond boss search. Had a really interesting phone call today that I want to share with you guys. And then there was a question asked earlier today on a, a, a broadcast that's um, that's gone on the best way to apply Lyme. So let me hit that and then I'll circle back. Let me see here. Bear with me a minute. I've got to find it here. Um, I'm going to hit the Lyme question real, real quick. Uh, what's the best way to apply Lyme into a pond? It's kind of a tedious way, to, tedious thing to do. Because, you know, if you're going to put a ton to two tons of Lyme per acre in a 20-acre lake, it's not easy. You know, and so what I tell folks to do is if you've got a John boat, take that John boat and attach a couple of pieces of plywood to the front, to the bow, coming back toward the middle. And if you got a front end loader, load the lime up on top of that um, plywood. And I'd, I'd, I'd use a trash pump and pump water out of the lake and pump it and just wash it off. Just wash it. Okay, holy cow, I've even got captions going on here. Jeez, it's weird today. All right, so let me see here. Danny Mac, doing good. Yeah, we had a little violent weather this afternoon. We had a little, had a little uh, hail storm. All right, so I'm going to back up and hit some of these questions. Okay, so applying lime to a pond, uh, I've seen people put on masks and blow it off with battery-powered leaf blowers. You know, the hard part is getting it into a vehicle. That's why I like to take one-inch plywood, put it on top of a 14-foot John boat, load a ton, two tons at a time, depending on your boat, you know, maybe half a ton on a small boat, and then take it out and get upwind and blow it downwind with a, with a leaf blower. That's a good way to do it. The battery on a leaf blower doesn't last but 30 minutes. You know, a trash pump where you're sucking water out of the pond and you choke down the output side of the pump with a PVC, you can build kind of like a little wand or a nozzle and squirt it on that lime and squirt it right off the plywood straight out into the water. That's a pretty efficient way to do things. So let's see here. Let me go down the road here. And John, I will take some pictures. The garden looks really cool. I've got 
I sprouted, I, I got some seeds from a seed saver. So I've got some heirloom tomatoes, some Roma tomatoes for, for uh, tomato sauce and uh, spaghetti sauce. I love to make salsa. And I've got uh, some seeds, I sprouted some tomatillos. The onions look good, garlic looks great. The tomatoes are small, we've had a little cool weather. <coughs> Potatoes are coming up, onions look good. I see Trey Carpenter, Wilson Nunley from Colorado is checking in. Chris Ragoni, he knows the deal. Hey, you know what, I forgot to do that. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Put that in the comment section, click like. Share this video right now to your timeline and you're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. In the Pond Boss mug. Yep, we got some mugs in, folks. Say it with me. It knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. I don't know how it does it, but it does. <coughs> Pond Boss Magazine. Hey, 35 bucks a year right there. This is what fuels the economy that allows us to be able to do this kind of show. Plus uh, sponsorships from Texas Hunter Feeders and Purina Mills. And um, uh, we appreciate them. Pontini Boats is also a good sponsor of the show. So, Bob, could you comment on the pluses and negatives of the, of the amount of rain we're having this year? What steps should Pond Meisters take? Well, you know, it depends on, um, holy cow, I just read Mike Cottrell. Aquamax is getting hard to get, Feed Store said, because of the virus. I cannot buy into that. I'm sorry. I can't, I cannot buy into that. Uh, the supply chain, feed stores are considered essential. So if somebody's telling you Aquamax is hard to get because of the virus, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let that comment stand on its own merit, and I will call Purina tomorrow and ask them if there's any supply chain issues. But I can't imagine there being supply chain issues for, for that, that fish food, for any food for that matter. Uh, the negative pluses and negatives, well, one of, the, one of the positives about rain is it keeps our ponds full. You know, one of the negatives, depending on the kind of overflow system you've got, if you've got a siphon system, you're okay. If you've got a bottom water release system, you're okay. But if the, when, when fresh rain comes in and it hits the pond, that fresh water flows in, flows across, and goes out the spillway. You know, so depending on the kind of, of water management structure you've got in your pond, that's going to determine whether the rainfall is a plus or a minus. The, it's, I don't ever consider it a minus. You know, being in the pond management business since 1980, I've seen three serious extensious, extending droughts, and I'd take excess rain any day over an extended drought. You know, but the other downsides is that if you've in, if you fertilize the pond, it can wash the fertilizer out. Depending on the timing, you might lose a spawn. You know, baby fish love to go to the shallow water, and a baby bass will flush downstream. That might not be a bad thing for most ponds. Most ponds have too many bass. But you could lose your first spawn of bluegills. Well, that's a bad thing, but followed up right behind it will be another spawn of bluegills. So a pond can overcome those sort of negatives pretty quick. All right, let's see... Uh, <clears throat> Brandon McGraw, what protein product is good to fatten up bass in a pond? I'm going to have an article in this next issue of Pond Boss, which is uh, at the printer, by the way, getting ready to get mailed here in the next few days. I think um, freshwater shrimp is a good product. Live shrimp, crawfish is a good product. Uh, rainbow trout in the fall is a good product. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming when you're asking product, you may be talking about fish food. If you want to feed the fish, my favorite fish food is Purina's Aquamax MVP. It's got nine different pellet sizes from little bitty pellets like so on up to pellets like so. And what you're doing there to fatten up a bass is fattening up what the bass eat. So you're feeding bluegills, you're feeding minnows, you're feeding other species of fish in a pond environment that which what that does is increase production of those bait fish that in turn feed the bass and make the bass get big. Now, if you've got feed trained bass, I'd be using some of the uh, Aquamax sport fish products like 600, even Aquamax largemouth. Purina makes a fish food that's about, oh, half, uh, probably three quarters of an inch in diameter. That's perfect for larger largemouth bass that are on feed. 
Let's see. Harrison Davis checking in from Georgia. James Sewell, how can you fix a pond that is silted in? I tell you what, I would I would drain it, let it sit for a year, then decide what to do about it. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit better answer than that. You have to ask yourself, is it worth it to fix the pond that's silted in? And when I say that, when you when you're going to try to get silt out of a pond that's silted in, that pond probably wouldn't built right in the first place, or it would not be silted in. Every pond has a life. In today's world, ponds are designed to where they can have a life that's close to 100 years. But ponds back in the 60s, 70s through there, they were designed with about a maximum lifespan of 50 years, which we're hitting that now with some of the ponds built in the 60s. You know, and so a silted in pond, you got to decide if the juice is worth the squeeze. It's going to take, you got to get the silt out of the pond, you got to move it three times. First, you got to get it out. Then you got to pile it up, which means you got to you got to push it up, load it, transport it, pile it, and then spread it out. So it's going to cost three times as much money to move that dirt than it would if you wanted to build a new pond. So what I tell folks is, if you've got room on your property immediately downstream from a silted-in pond, let's look at what it might take to build a new pond rather than try to revive an old pond that has no habitat in it. So, Danny Mac, doing good. Yep, violent weather. We had a little bit of that. John Funk, Roller Coaster, Michigan. Steve Lewis, I see. Trey Carpenter, Jacob West. Jacob, your feeders have been shipped. They should be coming at you in a couple of days. Wilson Nunley from Colorado. We already said hi. Luke Bro. Chart system on one acre pond will require some sort of chemical to clear colloidal clay, going with roughly 2,000 pounds of gypsum. You know, that's kind of the hard part uh, on trying to figure out how much gypsum you got to use. I mean, I've seen ponds that were sort of muddy where 200 pounds per acre foot was enough. But I've also seen where 2,000 pounds per acre foot was just barely enough. So you, you kind of got to figure that out. It's not easy to do. I'm glad you did the jar test because the jar test helps you figure it out. See Leanne checking in. How about a rain dance in South Louisiana? You know what? You guys never do with that rain. Holy cow. I see Stan Lee checking in. You know what? Hey, Jacob, you tell your bride we'll make some salsa. We get past this coronavirus, we'll open up a bottle of Corona. We'll get a six pack, except you like the uh, apple kind of beer. We'll get some of that and we'll check that out. We'll make some salsa, buddy. I'm kind of wanting some of that salsa too. I see Tim Jackson checking in from the Carolinas. He's a Clemson guy. Good to see Tim Jackson, John Henry, Harrison Davis did the hashtag deal. Walden's Feed, Mike Cottrell says. Walden's Feed, that's over in, um, they got a store in Weatherford, Mineral Wells, and Millsap, I believe. They will get that fish food for you. <laughs> Christopher Argelard, he bought some Aquamax, but almost returned. There's a funky picture on the back of the back. That's actually a mug shot that should be in the post office. Ben Arnold, thoughts on making an ex existing established pond bigger? I'll tell you what my thoughts are about that. Um, I see Barry Gann checking in. Good to see you, Barry. <clears throat> Making the existing established pond bigger. I, I'm actually, especially a pond that's existed for a while and if it's become kind of static, I love making it bigger if the watershed will support it. And if most of the time when you make a pond bigger, you're going to raise the dam to cover more area. Now, if you do that, be smart about it because you can, um, you, you need to improve the habitat around the perimeter of the new ground that you're going to flood. So you're gonna, if you're gonna make an existing pond that's established bigger, it's a good idea to lower it a few feet, either by pumping it down or opening a valve, or I don't know that I would, I don't know that I would cut the dam, but I might cut the spill away a little bit to lower the pond down some. And then when you get ready, you got There's a process to raise the dam because the dam, if it was built right, is covered in topsoil. So you're gonna, depending on how much you want to go up with that dam. You're gonna to have to scrape the topsoil off, scrape the topsoil off the backside slope. You have to widen the dam and go up whatever span you want to go up. 
to keep the slope on the back side, you got to calculate that amount of dirt. But you can flood some new ground and be, it'd be if you're going to double the size, for example, now you can go take that perimeter and make some outstanding habitat there and build that into your plan. So, yes, you can. And there's some of my thoughts on that. Jacob, um, what pH level do you recommend consideration of fertilization? Well, Jacob, I'll tell you, a pH is somewhere between six and eight is ideal, but what you're really looking at is alkalinity. <clears throat> so as long as your alkalinity is a, what the books tell you is 20 parts per million is enough to be able to fertilize a, a lake and get a bloom. But I'm going to tell you it's more like 40 parts per million. 20 is enough, but when you fertilize it, a lot of that um, alkalinity is going to get bound in your bloom, which will make your alkalinity read lower than it really is because a lot of that calcium carbonate that makes up the alkalinity is going to be bound in your in your algae bloom or your plankton bloom or your, or your zooplankton. So I'm going to tell you 40 parts per million is better. Now, where you guys are over there north of St. Joe, I really expect that you're going to be fine over there. Your soils ought to be good. All right, Brandon McGraw, that's the exact answer I'm looking for. We just used shrimp for the first time and caught our first three beautiful bass. All right, I'm glad I hit that one right. Dennis Smith checking in from Pittsburgh. Jing Chen, Harrison, I'm here. This is my Facebook account. Hey, man, Harrison, you got a friend on board, buddy. Fill him in. Tell him what's going on. I see Mike DeMint just shared the video. Good. Good deal. Way to go. Howdy boy, Mike. Appreciate it, man. Mike Hales from Memphis, Tennessee. Tracy Smith is doing the thing. Rick Morrison, fertilizer recommendation. Um, the... Uh, the fertilization recommendation I'm going to make, fertilizer, um, good gosh, what's the name of it? we got a bunch of bags back here in the office. It's Pond Pro, I believe. It's a, it's typically like a super triple phosphate. American Sport Fish Hatchery sells a bunch of that stuff. It's a, If you can find a water-soluble, like a 11320 or 17340, where the phosphorus number is higher. Now, of course, there's people watching this. They're going to want to see Leo Wynn checking out, checking in. He's going to want to debate me about phosphorus. Some areas of the, of the country have too much phosphorus. Ponds that need to be fertilized typically don't have enough phosphorus to perpetuate the bloom or create a bloom. So, um, oh gosh, let me look. Here it is. I got Palm Boss Magazine right here. Let me, let me find it. I'll give you the name of that fertilizer, but... I have used everything from liquid fertilizer that I buy at the co-op to uh, powdered fertilizer that I buy. Let me see here. Hold on a minute. Let me see here. Well, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time digging. Pretty sure it's Pond Pro. Anyway, look in your Palm Boss magazine and your resource guide. You're going to find it in there. That's what I should have said in the first place. Let's see here. Um, on your... Uh, Fertilizer recommendation. You know what? They're, all these fertilizers are labeled. The pond ones are. And you typically need, I'm going to tell you, somewhere between two and four pounds of fertilizer per surface acre of water to initiate a bloom. Now that may sound a little high, but it also depends on the alkalinity. If the alkalinity is too high, you need more. If the alkalinity is too low, you need more. But based on what your water chemistry is, that determines the rate Plus, you need to look at the visibility. I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had today, which will be kind of fun here. I'm going to bust through some of these questions right quick before I get way far behind. Dan Reasoner says, Last May I fertilized and weed killed my pasture. The next time it rained in early June, I had a major fish kill of catfish and bluegill in my half acre pond. Do you think the runoff of weed killer could have killed my fish? I'm going to say that's a possibility, but I'm going to tell you that it could be just as much decomposing organic matter you know if you if you fertilize and kill weeds in a pasture and you use the um, recommended application rates it's typically not so much a problem with fish kills but what can happen is if you've got a stable chemistry pond and you've changed the chemistry of the soil by killing plants and adding fertilizer you certainly can change the chemistry of your pond, especially if you get a flooding type rain. So that that could be. So here, here's the answer: 
probably was not because or caused by the chemicals you used, but it could be caused by the consequences of using those chemicals. Harrison Davis saw a copperhead swimming near the shore yesterday. He didn't spend any time staying around. I thought he was interesting because a lot of the water snakes we see will sit and not flee. I'm glad I didn't try to pick it up. Proper ID for weeds and snakes is crucial. Bam, that's right. Aaron DS, will the green sunfish population in my pond ever go down? Yes, it will. If you stock it with largemouth bass, green sunfish spawn once a year. Be sure you've got bluegills because what will happen is is as your pond begins to mature, and I'm, I'm making an assumption here. I'm making an assumption that the green sunfish had an advantage to be able to become the dominant species. And once you stock largemouth bass and they begin to reproduce and you've got enough largemouth bass to eat young of the year fish, then once the bass gain an advantage over the green sunfish, their numbers are gonna drop. Now it might take 18 months, might take two years, but at some point the bass will overtake the green sunfish and the bluegill can just survive because they can outlast the attrition because they reproduce so much. <clears throat> There's Lydia Jacobs North. Good to see you, girl. Tracy Smith, Perfect Pond Plus. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tracy Smith. He just used it. Lydia's saying howdy. Good to see, good to see Lydia. Perfect Pond Plus. Thank you. Sometimes my brain's a little short on stuff like that. All right. Let's see. Yep, Ed Brewer's in there, too. There's Latham Pugh. Appreciate your help. Hey, you got your fish, I heard. Heard a rumor that you got some F1 Tiger Bass from American Sport Fish Hatchery uh, earlier in the week. Or if you haven't, you're going to. No, I think you did. You got some earlier this week. I think I think uh, Sean brought them to you. All right, so here we go. Chad Bowman, Eastland, checking in at the pond. Bought a gimmick umbrella, umbrella trap. They're crap quality, but had eight large bullheads. Repairs needed after first use. Has me thinking about improving the design. You know, you always have been an entrepreneurial sort of guy. I've seen that umbrella trap, but I thought it was kind of flimsy myself. So uh, maybe a good idea. Jacob West. Yep, uh, Latham says not one of them floated. That's good. <laughs> We don't like delivering fish that die. It does happen from time to time. We don't like it. Jacob West, tip for controlling snakes. Place large rocks along the edge of the pond and the snakes will lay on them for the sun and use your favorite gun. You know, I tell you the first time I figured out I had a snake problem on the first fish farm that I leased. I leased a fish farm way back in 1980. And I started seeing, and, and that the place had probably been mostly unoccupied and unmanaged for over a year. And I did, I did see, I didn't know much about snakes, but I knew I just got through buying a bunch of catfish fingerlings and I saw this rotund snake laying on the shore and I shot it with my 410 and cut it open and there were about 15 little three to five inch channel catfish fingerlings in it. And that's when it hit me that these things might not be good for a fish farm. So my buddy and I got a Q-beam spotlight and a 410 shotgun a few nights later, we shot at night. They were bundled up. It was about this time of year. And they were clumped up reproducing in the edges of all that we had. I think 35 ponds on that 60-acre fish farm west of Wichita Falls. And we drove around. I drove the truck, held the Q-beam spotlight out the window. He's standing on the bed of the truck with a 410. And we shot over 90 snakes that night. 90. There was one bunch where there were about 10 snakes in the same bundle. He killed five of them with one shot from a 410 shotgun. Go figure. So that's when I began to figure out the snakes were up not pleasant on a fish farm. I mean, we live with them everywhere else, but you know what? There you go. Let's see here. Holy cow, I'm getting behind here. Woo. Mark Hugh Mabry, five acre pond, three years old. No crappie stock, but they've taken over, it seems. I pulled 400 three-inch crappie out this spring. Any recommendations? Uh, Five-acre pond, you've taken out 400 three-inch crappie. Those crappie this spring, they're at least a year old. So what that suggests to me is you don't have enough largemouth bass. Now, that's a typical response for crappie in small bodies of water. It's typically not a matter of if as much as it is a matter of when they're going to overtake the pond. You know, and so uh, I've talked about this before, but 
what happens is crappie in warm water fish ponds spawn first or they don't spawn at all. So they're inconsistent spawners. Like this year, we've had back-to-back -back cold fronts that have driven crappie shallow to deep, shallow to deep. And if they don't spawn, they'll absorb their eggs and it's not reproduce. But in a year like last year, they could, they could reproduce prolifically and if they can gain a foothold and eat the babies of the fish coming off the nests throughout the spring, they're the ones that can be become dominant. So I would uh, tell you that I would be trying to manage for more bass of larger sizes, meaning two and a half pounds or bigger. So study what it takes to grow bass two and a half pounds or larger in a five acre pond, which means culling some bass if you've already got them, if the bass are a little crowded or whatever, you're going to have to depend on bass to help thin their numbers. And if you if that doesn't work for you, let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Chad Sepulveda, I added gypsum rock to my pond and had about 500 pounds left over in a pile in the bank. Deer have started using it as a mineral lick, I guess for the calcium. Yeah, that's a little bit weird. Um, gypsum is calcium sulfate. So... It's although it's kind of like a salt, it's really not, but um, in the sense that sodium chloride is, or you know, magnesium chloride, or one of the other traditional kinds of salt. Which uh, I don't know why. I guess the deer wants to. No, I'm not going to say that. Jay Spires from Charlotte checking in. Good to see you. Yes, thank you. The family and I are well. We uh, we've had our two grandchildren now for five weeks. And we're starting to kind of get a sense for our for our safety. And they went home last night. So I appreciate you asking that. Uh, they've gotten homesick. Their mom is a nurse, but she's an administrator at Baylor Hospital in Dallas. And Baylor has done an astonishing job to keep just one piece of the hospital for corona patients. They check in outside. They got to meet the symptoms before they even come in the hospital. And my daughter is managing her uh, chain of command from an office sequestered away from the hospital. So we're pretty we're pretty pretty comfortable with that. And so the kids went home last night after five weeks at our house. I mean, we played games, Monopoly, gone fishing, paddle boat, all kinds of cool stuff. Matt Singley, <clears throat> can you order Purina Aquamax MVP online? I can't find it at any of the feed stores. You know what, in South Mississippi, Matt, hey, by the way, your book was brought into my desk today. I'm gonna be signing your book and sending it on. Holy cow, I need to pause a minute because it looks like my battery is about to go dead on this phone. Let me see what's going on here. Y'all bear with me here. I gotta make sure that this battery's being charged on my phone. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Because if it dies, we're done. All right, I'm hoping that works. If the battery dies, we're done. Okay, now I got another little deal here. Yeah, it looks like it's charging. We're a little bit cockeyed, which that's for Ron Ardwan, cockeyed, if he's watching. Okay, little adjustment. Okay, so, um, Christopher says, can you order live freshwater shrimp? Yeah, you know what? If you'll send me an email, I'll, if anybody is looking to to uh, buy, I've got an article coming up in the May June issue of Pond Boss about Macrobrachium rosenbergi and supplemental stocking of freshwater shrimp in the ponds for bass food, or if you want to grow some to eat, you know. So uh, uh, if you will email me, I'll connect you up with the guy that sells them because he can ship them. You can come pick them up. They're not that expensive, you know. They're like twelve or fifteen cents a piece. For a three eighths inch long shrimp, you stock them into the to the vegetation. They're gonna live and grow and eat. <coughs> Josie said that uh, Wayne just bought me a Henry. Yep, it shoots pretty nice. Yep, you don't get them with the twenty two, you can bust them with the four ten. I love it. Danny Mac, some on Amazon Amazon have a zipper so they can be open. I had those with no zipper. Had to destroy to pull out five pound cats. I'm not exactly, oh, I guess he's talking to somebody else because I have no idea what he's talking about. 
I see Jim Morgan checking in. Good to see Jim. Crappie or crappy? <laughs> they are in North Carolina. God dang, there goes my dadgum battery again. This cord may not be doing it, folks. I'm going to try it and see. We'll see. Hang on a minute. Well, if it ain't one thing, it's another. Woo! All right. If we lose the battery, we lose the phone, we lose the broadcast, I'll say goodbye. But I think it's working now. All right. Uh, let's see here. Ron, bring me a beer. Yeah, those South Louisiana guys are going. Yep. So if, if you guys do want to talk about freshwater shrimp, send me an email and I'll connect you up and get you some information and talk to you about that. Scott McClurg threw down my first round of the new Natural Lake Muck Biotics pellets today. That's cool. Good deal. You know, what he's talking about there is Natural Lake Biosciences, which is one of the uh, uh, sponsors and advertisers in Palm Boss Magazine, Landon Wyatt. He's been on my show before. Um, they do a pretty dead gum good job of helping analyze your water chemistry, figure out what kind of plants you've got, and they custom design products for you to help improve expedite the breakdown of organic matter on the bottom of the pond, especially in aerated ponds. Works real, real, real good. There's David Schneiderman checking in. Easy Docs, folks. Check out Easy Docs. Click on, after the show, click on David's website or click on his Facebook page. Friend up with him. If you're looking for a floating dock, David is the go-to guy for that. Ronnie, Chris are going to get to meet at the Cabon He's going to cook sausage gravy and give him your aqua profile. Oh, look at you guys. Y'all got a dead gum love affair going on. Cool. Texas Hunter, good deal. I'm going to tell you about a phone call I got today. By the way, Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. I used to tell everybody it was cheaper than a Friday night date, but it's way cheaper than a Friday night date because we're not going anywhere. Willie Howe, next door neighbor, plugged my sternal stuff. Hey, I talked to my cousin last night, Willie, who used to be a salvage dealer. He was going to make a phone call today or tomorrow because he's got a guy that he wants to talk to that might be interested. But uh, Willie, Willie, Willie Howe works for Sterno in their um, Texarkana, Texas plant. And he's got a whole bunch of rejected freight. It's not rejected because it's bad. It's because there might be two or three boxes that were damaged and he needs to get it out of the warehouse. So if any of you guys know anything about Snerno products, you know, the heat used in the food industry, there's candles, there's all kinds of cool stuff. You guys private message Willie and he'll talk to you. I see Joseph Reynolds. By the way, something else I meant to tell everybody. Here I'm hawking Snerno on a pond management show. But uh, I was talking to Sean McNulty with American Sport Fish Hatchery yesterday. They have got a few more six to seven inch F1 Tiger bass than they need. That's not a lot. I think he's willing to cut the price just a touch if you want to buy some. So what he said was to send me an email, send the email to me, and I'll connect you guys up with them. And I think he wants to sell them in lots of at least a hundred or more. And it'll be a little off the retail price because he needs the pond space for the next inventory coming in. And he's got like 2,000 or 3,000 extra ones that he'd like to sell. So, let's see here. <clears throat> I said hello to Joseph Reynolds. Good to see Joseph. Mike Monroe, what's a good chemical to use in what looks like little green seeds that just started last year to take over the whole pond? At, uh, tell you what, dude. For you guys that are having aquatic plant issues, go to Aqua Plant. It's a website at the Texas A&M University's um, fisheries department and you can identify the plants and they've got suggested herbicides for that and what you're probably what you probably have is water meal and water meal is the smallest aquatic plant on the planet and it's highly invasive looks just like a little bit bigger grain than corn meal on the floating on top of the water <clears throat> so go that direction now holy care is another one chad gillespie might know where you can unload all your stuff if the price is right I can transport it. There we go, Willie. Hey, man, save a few candles for my wife if we make a sale here. <laughs> she likes stuff like that. So, uh, uh, all right, I want to tell you about a phone call I got today. I got a, a guy that's been a Pond Boss subscriber for a long time. 
live south of Amarillo, Texas, not far from Lake Tanglewood out there. And um, he was calling me because he was a little worried about his water chemistry. Because last year, with a two and a half acre pond, he, he, he the developer tapped into some treated effluent water coming from the city of Amarillo that flows into this pond. <clears throat> and his concern is that last year when the water came in this time of year, it was clear. Now the pond, because he had a, a leak in the input pot pipe coming from the effluent, the pond dropped about 10 or 12 feet. So the developer fixed the pipe and filled that 10 to 12 feet up just within a few days and his pond turned green. So it went from what he liked with six to seven foot visibility, but now it's pea suit green. And he's got little strands of filamentous algae growing up along the edges that was bare dirt just a few weeks ago. So he was pretty dead gum. Um, he was pretty dead gum informed about algae, plankton blooms, feeding fish, the fish species that he stocked. But what he had a hard time figuring out was how to take the different facts that he has and cognitively tie them up into a management strategy that he could use. So here's the facts. He said, I said, what's your water visibility? He says, oh man, it can't be more than four or five inches. What that means to me is I haven't checked it. So I told him to check it. Check your visibility and see exactly what it is. Then what's the, what's the shade of green? Is it pea soup green? Does it look like a brand new oak leaf? Is it the color of, uh, of olives? Is it brownish, green? What's the color? He said, well, it's green. So I said, all right, you need to quantify that and figure out and describe it. So start taking notes. So what I told him was check his visibility and accurately check it. I bet, I bet almost anything his visibility is 18 inches. So what I explained to him is, is this is the time of year you raised your pond, whatever it was, 10 or 12 feet, two and a half acres, 10 or 12 feet. So you quadrupled the volume of water with water coming out of an effluent treated sewer treatment plant that's got some nitrogen and phosphorus in it, where last year it was crystal clear because the nutrients that were in the water ended up being bound by rooted aquatic plants. He dealt with rooted aquatic plants. So now this year, he's not, he doesn't have that. So he's got this rich plankton bloom. So I said, before he did it, it last year he treated algae with, with cutrine, which is a copper-based algae side. And so he was asking, should he do that? So my advice was, measure the visibility of the water, describe the color and write it down and then compare. And if you can see the color shifting, if it's changing from like a vibrant green to a little darker green, to a little darker green, to a little darker green, to kind of a brownish color, that means that zooplankton are feeding on the algae. If the water stays the same color for a week or 10 days, then we should have it analyzed and see, is it blue-green algae? Which is early in the year for that, but it could be. You know, and so we can, we can preserve a sample, send it off, let Bill Cody look at it, let Landon Wyatt look at it, let CPRO look at it, let somebody look at it before you do a thing about treating it. And then he said, oh, by the way, I've got duckweed. And last year it kind of got out of hand. So I said, well, you know what? What, um, how much did it grow? He said, well, it covered over half the pond. And I said, what do you see now? He said, most of it froze out, but I am seeing some of it. What should I do about it? Well, you know, we talked about dipping it out with a skimmer, with a, like a swimming pool skimming net. It's a little bit more work than he wants to do. So I said, all right, what, let's, what you do is spend a little time on that aqua plant website. I'd be looking at Floridone because he can, he can regulate the amount of water that comes in his pond and goes out of his pond. So he can look at something like Fluoridone, which would take the duckweed out and it wouldn't come back until a source brought it in again in a couple of years. You know, so the conversation was this. He understood that, that the water chemistry was good because his pH is seven. He understood that the temperature is normal. He understood that his, his fish stocking numbers have been good. He's, he understood that uh, algae grows this time of year. But what he quite didn't tie and bring in and loop it around was the reaction of fresh water that has nutrients onto soils that have stored nutrients that now dissolve those nutrients up into the water column and create a plankton bloom. 
So all the circumstances for him to have a, 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 a plankton bloom were just perfect. So what I told him was, start feeding your fish some Aquamax MVP. I see Robbie Shell, he's going to love to hear that. You know, and so I told him to measure his visibility. And I told him to describe the color green the water is and see if it doesn't shift after about three or four days. Because the way he described it, it's a young bloom. And it's going to mature and change and the water clarity is going to increase. And if that doesn't happen, then we talk about what to do about it. I see Tammy Pisarski checking in from Lubbock. Todd Austin, Drew Hay. Todd's checking in. <clears throat> so let's see, it's 10 after 7. Hey, don't forget, uh, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like, share this to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold, and a Palm Boss hat. I still keep getting the dadgum low battery notification on my phone. So I've got a bad cord here or something going on. Let's see, Drew Bachman just liked the Pond Boss video. Good to see Drew. So, um, there will be some more questions. Let me back up and make sure I haven't missed any. We've got a little sales going on here. Danny Mac, I don't know if they'll ship those fish. Let's see here. We talked about Mike Monroe's Little Green Seeds. That's probably Fluoridone as well, Mike. But spend a little time on that Aqua Plant website and you'll see the different choices you've got. Let's see here. I think I've got, I think I've answered. Oh, okay, here's one, Josh Green, I missed this one. Josh says, just wondering if you can offset excavation costs by selling clay soil from the site. I didn't know if it was some common practice or likely someone would be willing. <clears throat> well, you know what? If you've got a market and somebody is willing to do it, you can sell clay. But here's the problem. is typically dirt's cheap, freight's high. You know, and so th in, the, in the very few cases that I've seen where people sell dirt, there's a specific purpose. Like they're getting ready to, I saw a guy in South Louisiana sell 450,000 cubic yards of clay because they were building a refinery and they needed clay on sandy soils. And they hauled it 20 miles. I've seen guys sell clay where they're building a new highway and they need to build an overpass. You know, but just to try to think that you're going to sell clay, probably ain't going to happen because there's just, there's just no market for it unless there's a specific project going on at the right time and you're in the right place. Let me see what else we got here. Let me go back. All right, I think I've covered all of them I can see. Yep, okay, if I've missed you, throw it back at me again. 7.13, we got a little bit more time if the battery doesn't go. <coughs> so um, I want to kind of go back to that phone conversation today where I think happy, my phrase is happy water. You know, here's what that means. Happy water means that and I see Drew Hay checking in from uh, Pennsylvania. I don't know if I said hi while or not. My mind's spinning on all these topics. There, there's a, you, you got to understand a little bit about water chemistry. You want your pH to be between about 5.3, which is Jim Morgan's pH at Richmond Mill Pond over there in Laurel Hill, North Carolina, home of Kingfisher Society, and up to just maybe a little bit over 8, 8.5. If it's between those, preferably between six and eight, that's perfect pH. But the pH is only an indication of what's dissolved in the water or not dissolved in the water. You know, a lower pH means the water's acidic, there's no minerals or metals, there's only free hydrogen ions causing that water pH to be lower. You know, and so once that happens, <clears throat> then you start understanding the happiness of water based on the biology. And the biology is impacted by the chemistry. And the chemistry is impacted by the biology. You know, earlier I was talking about alkalinity. And I like to see alkalinity, uh, Jacob West asked the question, of 40 parts per million or more. And the reason I like that is because if you've got 40 parts per million of total alkalinity, you can promote a plankton bloom with a little bit of fertility and not negatively impact the alkalinity. In other words, 
How many roll eggs does it take to get rid of the acid? All right. And so the analogy I'm making there is the alkalinity is the roll eggs. So if all the roll eggs are used up, you need more roll eggs or you're going to have an ingestion. Ponds will do that. You know, and so basically what we're looking for is we're looking for alkalinity. We're look, and, and I like to know what the different metals and the different minerals are that's dissolved in the water because different metals and minerals and nutrients to, to dissolved into the water influences what will grow in it in terms of plankton, plants, uh, and even fish. So I, I see the chemistry affected by the biology sometimes. My nose is itching. That means we have company. <coughs> uh, where when you've got a good plankton bloom in marginal alkaline alkalinity waters, you're going to see the pH spike up and down some through the course of the day because of photosynthesis and respiration of plankton bloom or of plants. So figuring out, and, and that's all biology talk to you. I know that. But where I'm going is I judge the color of the water reading a bloom and compare that to the chemistry to be able to give sound advice on what you can do to help keep your water happy. The other part of keeping water happy is allowing it to cleanse itself. The way you can cleanse itself is move it. That's why we talk about aeration. Some ponds need aeration, some ponds don't. All right, so let's see if we got some things coming up here. Let me take a look here. Holy cow, I'm missing some things. Ron, I want to buy a microscope to measure the concentration of zooplankton as the bloom cycles from young to mature. My blooms are pretty consistent, which enables me to examine the maturity levels often if it recycles. Any advice on the correct type of microscope? I'd get in touch. Since you live, you're an LSU tiger. You f call them and talk to them. See if they can let you use a few of theirs in a lab somewhere and find out what you're comfortable with. You know, part of the problem with having a microscope it's kind of like the problem with having an electrofishing boat. You can go out and